OK, let's discuss these questions. Question one, the key factor that seals the rental deal. We actually covered this part last week, so let's take a very quick look at uh, page 22, chapter five. Uh, so why did this go so well? Um, the group that took this question mentioned on the one hand, Sir Walter's ego. As it says here, Sir Walter had been flattered into his very best and most polished behavior. Uh, Mr. Shepard tells Sir Walter that Admiral Croft sees him as a model of good breeding. Zhao Yang Ji Hao. To breed is to raise, uh, usually to raise an animal, but also to raise children. So he has been raised well. He has a good family. He has a good bloodline. All things that Sir Walter cares about. So that's one reason. Uh, and this group also mentioned the other reason is that Admiral Croft is not a nobody. Um, he is, first of all, an admiral. And also, Sir Walter has declared the admiral to be the best looking sailor he had ever met with. And we know from last week that to Sir Walter, looking good is a sign of high status. So this is also something that Sir Walter cares about. Uh, so in addition to the men, we can also add a further reason, which is the women. As it says here, each lady already wanted a deal, and so they only saw good manners in each other. I think it's interesting that Jane Austen first tells us about the women before she tells us about the men, and that when she tells us about the men, it's always a backhanded compliment. So like when it says Sir Walter had been uh, first, it says that uh, there there was good humor, open, trusting liberality on the admiral side. This is from Sir Walter's perspective, right? This is what he sees in the admiral. And this seems like a good thing, right? Seems like Sir Walter finally knows how to judge someone's character, but then the novel tells us, no, no, it's because Sir Walter had been flattered by Mr. Shepard, so he was already in a good mood. Right, so e ball e bien. It's a compliment, but it's backhanded. Uh, and same for the uh, this paragraph here, right? Sir Walter says the Admiral is the good looking sailor. And as long as he Sir Walter could have somebody do the Admiral's hair, he would not be ashamed of being seen with him anywhere. So again, looks good, but the hair needs work. Uh, same for the Admiral. Um, there's no harm in him, but he will never be the life of the party in London. Right, so good and then bad, or in this case, bad and then good. But when discussing the women, there is no bad, right? They saw nothing but good manners, all good. I thought that was pretty interesting, the way that uh, Austin treated the men and the women differently. Question two, how would you describe the two young women and what does it mean to call them modern? So a few groups took this question and they all agreed that H Henrietta and Louisa were young, happy, energetic, carefree, spirited people and fashionable, as it says here. Um, and they were also well educated. So uh, Henrietta and Louisa, young ladies of 19 and 20. OK, so Louisa is the older one. Uh, they had brought from a school at Exeter all the usual stock of accomplishments. So when they went to boarding school in Exeter, they did quite well. Uh, if you remember, Anne and Elizabeth also went to boarding school, I think also in Exeter, not quite sure. Um, but it, it was traditional for the upper class in that period to educate its women. Uh, the idea is that an educated woman would make for a better wife and a better mother. So um, they usually go to boarding school. 
even today, Exeter is known as the place where the rich and famous send their children. Uh, now they were living to be fashionable, happy, and merry. We talked before about the difference between these two. Merry is like laughing all the time and being very fun. Happy is being satisfied with life and always being content. These two young, young women have both. Their dress had every advantage, which means they knew how to wear clothing in a fashionable way. Their faces were rather pretty. OK, so the word rather in American English means quite or a little bit, not very. But in British English, it means very. So their faces were very pretty. Uh, and also in British English, the word quite also means very. Their spirits were extremely good. They had a good energy, good spirits. Their manners, unembarrassed and pleasant. So they had good manners, and the way that they expressed those manners were unembarrassed, so they're never awkward, never um, too stuck on being very formal. And their manners were pleasant. They made people enjoy being around them. Uh, today, we don't talk about manners very much. Uh, usually when we talk about manners, the idea is like don't annoy other people, right? But manners were a very important thing back in the day. Um, and so when we think about manners, we often think, oh, these are some rules that you have to follow. When you meet this person, do this. When you, when somebody says this to you, say that in return. But manners are not that fixed. Manners are not something that uh, is written down in stone. Right? Confucius said that the gentleman is not a tool. You can't just follow the rules blindly. Different people will have different styles of manners. So for Louisa and Henrietta, their manners are unembarrassed and pleasant. For Admiral Croft, as we just saw, his manners are open and liberal. Uh, free basically a very free kind of manner that doesn't mean he has no manners it means that he is open to different kinds of people and different styles of interaction continuing they were of consequence at home which means when they were at home people cared about what they said and what they thought so this is the opposite of Anne. Right at and she, and at home is of no consequence. Nobody cares about her. But Henrietta and Louisa, people, her family, their uh, their family care about them. And they were favorites abroad. So when they leave home and they enter society, everybody likes them. Um, right. And then the word modern appears somewhere around here. Modern, and there we go. More modern minds and manners. So the way they think and the way they behave. Yeah, so this description is already a very evocative description. After reading this, we immediately get an idea of what kind of women they are. Young, open, carefree, fashionable, happy, enjoying their life as single women. They have newer ways of thinking. They're not as traditional. Their behavior is also not as traditional, but it's still polite. So we can compare this to their parents, right? Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove. Uh, in the old English style, so they have a more traditional kind of manners. They were friendly and hospitable. Hospitable, how could they like to entertain guests? Not much educated, not at all elegant. Uh, so it feels like they're like an older generation, maybe not as polished, but they're still good, kind people. Whereas uh, these two young women are fashionable, polished, 
also good, kind people, but but also joyful, uh, energetic people. And because Henrietta and Louisa are women, we can also compare them with Lady Elliot. Of course, Lady Elliot was married, uh, but in her short biography, we didn't have any mention of her life before marriage. Seems like the most important part of her life was taking care of her children and her husband. Henrietta and Louisa are the exact opposite. 19 and 20, they can get married already. They are of marriable age. Uh, Henrietta is engaged to Charles Hayter, but they're not married yet. Louisa, still single, but she doesn't seem desperate for a husband. She's enjoying her own life. And the biggest difference between Lady Elliot and these two is that these two are happy. Lady Elliot seemed kind of depressed. So yeah, uh, comparing with the previous generation, they do seem very modern. Question three, understanding of children, page 30. OK, paragraph two, as to the management of their children. So this is talking about the Musgrove family. Um, how do they deal with the young children? How do they think about the young children? Or in this case, how do they manage the children? His, this is Charles, uh, Mary's husband. His theory was much better than his wife's and his practice not so bad. So he did a better job than his wife of managing the children. I could manage them very well if it were not for Mary's interference was what Anne often heard him say and had a good deal of faith in. So Anne does believe what Charles is saying. A good deal just means very much. A, sorry, a good deal of means very much. But when listening in turn to Mary's reproach of Charles spoils the children so that I cannot get them into any order, I can't control them. She never had the smallest temptation to say very true. So this tells us that Anne agrees more with Charles than with Mary. So it seems like it's Mary who is uh, interfering and in causing trouble for managing the children. Uh, and then the other people also talk about the children. For example, uh, here, I wish you could. No, sorry, no. This is about uh, Mary being sick. Next one. Mary's declaration was, I hate sending children to the great house. To Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove, her, her father-in-law and mother-in-law. Though their grandmama is always wanting to see them, for she humors and indulges them. In other words, she lets the children do what they want. To such a degree, and gives them so much trash and sweet things that they are sure to come back sick and cross, which means in a bad temper for the rest of the day. So like angry, annoyed, that kind of thing. And Mrs. Musgrove took the first opportunity of being alone with Anne to say, Oh, Miss Anne, I cannot help wishing Mrs. Charles, Mary, had a little of your method with those children. They are quite different creatures with you. So like when you're around them, they pay attention to you, basically. But to be sure, in general, they are so spoilt. It is a pity you cannot put your sister in the way of managing them. To put someone in the way of means to guide someone. Um, OK, so Mary thinks that Mrs. Musgrove is spoiling the children. Mrs. Musgrove thinks that Mary is spoiling the children. They are as fine, healthy children as ever were seen, poor little dears, without partiality. So uh, here, She's saying, I don't say this simply because they're my own grandchildren. I really do think they are fine, healthy children. 
Partiality means bias. Even today. But Mrs. Charles knows no more how they should be treated. So she's saying Mary doesn't know how to take care of children. Bless me, how troublesome they are sometimes. I assure you, Miss Anne, it prevents my wishing to see them at our house so often as I otherwise should. So here she's saying, if the children were less annoying, I would welcome them more into my house. I believe Mrs. Charles is not quite pleased with my not inviting them oftener. So I think Mary wants her children to come visit me more. But you know it is very bad to have children with one, which means with you, that one is obliged to be checking every moment. Don't do this and don't do that. Or that one can, oh sorry, checking means to control, to, con to stop them, to prevent them from doing something. Even today, uh, the, the verb check can also mean to stop or to prevent. Or that one can only keep in tolerable order by more cake than is good for them. So here Mrs. Musgrove is saying, uh, I don't like the kids over because they are hard to take care of. I have to keep telling them, don't do this, don't do that. And the only way I can control them is to give them cake. So from this many directional conversation, what can we say about their attitude toward children? One group took this question and they saw that Everybody agreed the children are annoying. And they're always saying, oh, I wish somebody else could control them. We don't have a discussion about what are they learning? We don't have a discussion about how much exercise do they have? Uh, we do have some discussion of what are they eating? But the discussion is basically they eat too much cake. So it seems like they're treating children as a kind of pet or like a burden. Last week we talked about Mrs. Clay. Uh, she has no money and the burden of two children. So children in this society seem to be annoying responsibilities that somebody has to take care of, but please don't make me take care of them. Uh, they're like kick kicking the children between them, the TP Uh And so how is that different from our society? Well, uh, the group I talked with mentioned that in our society, many parents also try to get somebody else to take care of their children, such as a cram school teacher. But this is mostly because they need more time to work. Uh, working hours are too long. They don't have enough time to spend with their children. But if they could spend more time with their children, most parents today would want to. So it's actually the opposite of in the story. In the story, they don't want to spend time with their children. They want somebody else to, to control them. Uh, but in our society, it's parents want to spend more time with their children, but they can't because they're too busy working at their job. Um, so today, we often think of children as like pure, innocent, full of potential, the future of society, kind, loving, innocent children. But this idea only started spreading in the romantic period of British literature, which is just before Jane Austen. So uh, in the late 1800s. No, in the late 18th century, late 1700s. Before that, traditionally, children were thought of as a pet, just like the characters in this book. You have to feed them, you have to clothe them, they cry all the time. Uh, and they're only valuable when they're old enough to go to work. Or when they are mature enough where you can talk with them. But before that, they're just useless. It's only after the Romantic period that we had a, a new idea of 
how children are actually uh, kind little angels. As you might have guessed, I myself don't like children very much. Question four. Uh, does Anne still have influence over Captain Wentworth? Let's look at this, page 41. OK, so this is when um, Anne was taking care of young Charles, the little kid who fell from a tree. Uh, and Mary and the rest of the family went to a party and met Captain Wentworth. And the very next day, Mary comes back and tells Anne all about the party. And then she mentions here, quote, Captain Wentworth is not very gallant by you, Anne, though he was so attentive to me. Typical Mary, always making it about herself. She's saying Captain Wentworth was not very polite about you, but he spent a lot of time and attention on me. Henrietta asked him what he thought of you when they went away. So when they were talking in private. And he said, you were so altered, he should not have known you again. Should means would. So he basically he said, you have changed so much that I barely recognize you. This is what Wentworth is thinking about Anne. Uh, and then because it's such a very weird thing to say, and uh, sorry, yeah, and then spends a page and a half thinking, what could he mean? And her conclusion is that. Um, let's see, where was it? Uh, It has to be here, right? I said page 41, so where, where is it? <gasps> ah, okay, yeah, here we go. Her power with him was gone forever. So she's thinking, um, because he said something so rude, he had not forgiven her. He had been most warmly attached to her and had never seen a woman since whom he thought her equal. But except from some natural sensation of curiosity, he had no desire of meeting her again. Her power with him was gone forever. So the idea is he still thinks that Anne is the best woman that he has ever met. But because Anne had rejected him so strongly in the past, now the only reason why he might want to see her is due to curiosity. And therefore Anne concludes she no longer has any influence over him. He no longer cares about her love. Uh, and if that's true, then she moves on to the next line. It was now his object to marry. That is his current goal. He has money. He is now a captain. He has come back to the land. Therefore, he must be looking for a wife. And so like Anne is thinking about all of this stuff, right? The man that I love hates me, doesn't care about me, is looking for a new wife, and he's looking among the Musgroves. And so I have to witness him pursuing another young woman torture. And all of this from one line, right? This is the only piece of evidence that she has. You were so altered that he should not have known you again. So the question is, is Anne right? Does her logic make sense? Well, the group I talked to said it could make sense. Um, especially if we look at the, well, it, we already saw it here, right? Um, he still thinks that she's the best woman that he's ever met. Next page. Um, he's looking for 
a woman with a strong mind with sweetness of manner. Well, Anne is sweet. But maybe he thinks that Anne does not really have a strong mind. Because remember, Anne broke off the engagement because she was persuaded by Lady Russell. So it's a sign that maybe she doesn't have a strong mind. So if that is the case, then uh, yeah, then Anne is completely correct. Wentworth really doesn't care about her anymore. Nothing she says or does will have any influence on him. But we have seen the movie. We know that he still loves her. So how can we interpret this line to arrive at the correct results? The idea here is that at the party, Wentworth was perfectly polite to everybody except Anne. She is the one person Frederick could not bring himself to give a compliment or to say something good about. Why? Maybe because he cares about her too much. He's still hurt that she broke off their engagement, which means that he still cares, which means that he's still hoping that maybe things could be different. And that could be Anne's power over him. Love and hate are two sides of the same coin. The true opposite of love is indifference. As Taylor Swift says, I forgot that you existed. Question five, naval warfare. All right, page 44 to 45. So here they are at the other dinner party and Wentworth is talking about his naval career, what happened in uh, in his time uh, in the Navy. So he's talking about how he had uh, one very old ship called the Asp. Uh, and then it says. After taking privateers enough to be very entertaining. I had the good luck in my passage home the next autumn to fall in with the very French frigate I wanted. I brought her into Plymouth. OK, so let's make sense of this. A privateer, if you look this up, it'll probably say something. Right, OK, so we're talking about the word privateers. The idea is that it it's somewhere between a Navy ship and a private ship. Uh, the owner or the captain of a ship can agree to fight for a country uh, unofficially. And any money that they take from the defeated ships, they would have to split with the country. Uh, and this is the main way that poor countries could fight on the, on the sea. Now, the British Navy is an official Navy. They have actual ships. They have an admiralty. But they follow similar rules. If they take a privateer, they defeat a privateer. They can take half their money and the other half goes to the government. And this is why um, we've been talking about how like Wentworth was poor and now he's rich. Or like why um, later on we're going to meet Benedict and Fanny Harville. Fanny died while Benedict was at sea. Uh, they were going to marry, but Fanny said, wait until you have more money. So how do sailors make money? They win battles and they take money from their opponents. Um, so when they meet a privateer, Wentworth says that it's very entertaining. Uh, and then he says that he falls in with a French frigate. A French fr a frigate is like a heavier ship. Uh, it's a heavier warship. It's an official Navy ship. Um, and so you would think, you know, when you meet a strong opponent, you might be a little scared or a little nervous. But here he says that it's 
uh, good luck, right? I had the good luck to fall in. Fall in means to fight. At that time, the ships, you, you know, you had to like align them and you had to fire cannons at each other. Um, so you have to like line up in the same direction. So to fight a ship is to fall in with them. And then it says that I brought her into Plymouth. Plymouth is a port. The idea is he defeated the French frigate, brought him back to land, and could take half of the money on the ship. Yeah, so like from this description of naval warfare, it's quite different from how we fight today, right? Today, uh, most navies are official organized navies. They fight because a country is at war, not because they need money. Um, if they win fights, they get promoted, but they don't get the treasure of the opponents. Very different system. Um, so you can see how sailors, captains, and admirals would have some social status. It's not like they just win battles. They win battles and money. Their ships are like their small kingdoms, small armies. They have entire control over their ships. Whereas today, a ship can only go where it is ordered to go, right? Even captains have to follow orders. Um, and so this kind of fighting on the sea is also very, uh, follows a similar logic to the fighting on land. The idea is that without long range weapons, when the guns are still very weak and can't shoot very far, actual fighting means actually facing a guy and actually, like in many times, sticking a knife or a bayonet into his stomach. It's a very physical kind of warfare. Um, and so there is a, a cachet of if you win battles, you are like more manly, more masculine. This is where the idea of glory came into warfare. Uh, because it's a test of physical strength as well as strategy. And so you can see that in this kind of naval warfare. A captain commands his ship, gets close to the enemy ship, beats him in a cannon battle, and gets to bring him home and take away his treasure. Very manly kind of war. Uh, if you took my introduction to British literature, you know that this changes in the First World War. OK, so uh, those are the five questions. Do you have other thoughts about them? OK, so if not, um, next before next week, please finish up to chapter 12. So let's start uh, at the beginning of chapter nine. This is page OK, Captain Wentworth was come to Kellynch as to a home to stay as long as he liked, being as thoroughly the object of the Admiral's fraternal kindness as of his wife. So remember, Wentworth, Frederick Wentworth, is the brother of Lady Croft, the Admiral's wife. So this sentence is saying that the Admiral is just as much a brother to Frederick as his wife is a sister to him. So he's treating Frederick like a, a real member of the family, not just by marriage. He had intended on first arriving to proceed very soon into Shropshire and visit the brother settled in that county. 
if you remember from the very first chapter, the first time we mentioned the word Wentworth is not Frederick Wentworth. It is his brother who is a curate in the country or in that part of the county. So this is the guy that Frederick is going to visit. Or was going to visit. But the attractions of Uppercross induced him to put this off. Basically, he was having such a good time with the Musgrove family, he decided not to go. There was so much of friendliness and of flattery and of everything most bewitching in his reception there. The old were so hospitable, the young so agreeable, that he could not but resolve to remain where he was and take all the charms and perfections of Edward's wife upon credit a little longer. Edward is the name of his brother. Uh, the idea is when you go visit somebody and there is a woman in the house, it is the woman's job to make you feel at home, to welcome the guest. And so, like for example, if he goes to visit Edward and he's treated well, he would then praise Edward's wife. He would say, oh, she has so much charm. She is a perfect wife and a perfect host. Well, now he decided not to go yet. So all of these ideas, all of these compliments, he, if he says them, he can only say them based on credit, based on trust, not based on evidence. It's like he's borrowing on that experience. He has not yet had the experience. He can only, you know, like when you borrow money, you borrow now and then you realize the debt later. Here, he's paying the compliment now and only later going to find out if it's worth it. It was soon Uppercross with him every day or almost every day. Uh, so he's staying at Kellynch and every day he goes to Uppercross. The Musgroves could hardly be more ready to invite than he to come. Remember, the book likes to make strange comparisons. The idea is he wants to come, they want to welcome him. Particularly in the morning when he had no companion at home, for the Admiral and Mrs. Croft were generally out of doors together, interesting themselves in their new possessions, their grass and their sheep, and dawdling about in a way not endurable to a third person, or driving out in a gig lately added to their establishment. So this is saying another reason Frederick Wentworth keeps coming to Uppercross is because there's nobody at home in Kellynch because the Admiral and Lady Croft keep going out. They go out to visit the estate of Kellynch. They go out to see the sheep. And basically they just like spend time together doing nothing. And uh, because Frederick is not married to them. This is very boring to him. And also they drive out in a gig. A gig is a small light car, horse drawn carriage for two people. Uh, I guess it's like Qing Bian Ma Tse. So either they go around the land or they go driving and in, basically they go on dates. So Wentworth is bored, so he comes to Uppercross. Hitherto, which means up till now, there had been but one opinion of Captain Wentworth. But means only. Among the Musgroves and their dependencies. So the Musgrove family basically only had a good opinion of Captain Wentworth. It was unvarying, which means it was always the same. Warm admiration everywhere. They all love him. But this intimate footing was not more than established when a certain Charles Hayter returned among them to be a good deal disturbed by it and to think Captain Wentworth very much in the way. So an intimate footing, a footing means a stance, a position. So the relationship between Wentworth and the Musgrove family had just been established when suddenly appeared the, this dude, Charles Hayter, and Charles Hayter thinks something is wrong and thinks that Captain Wentworth is getting in the way. We know we will learn later that Charles Hayter is 
engaged to Henrietta. So he, he's probably jealous of Wentworth. Like everybody loves him. Even Henrietta likes him very much. And so Charles Hayter might be a bit jealous about that. Uh, and then we get an introduction to Charles Hayter. Do we have time to finish this page? Do you want me to finish this page? All right, let's keep going. Charles Hayter was the eldest of all the cousins. Remember, Charles Hayter is related to them. They're family, although it's kind of distant family. So Charles Hayter was the eldest of all the cousins and a very amiable, pleasing young man between whom and Henrietta there had been a considerable, a considerable appearance of attachment. So they're connected to each other. Previous to Captain Wentworth's introduction, he was in orders. So he is a member of the Church of England. And having a curacy in the neighborhood where residence was not required, lived at his father's house, only two miles from Uppercross. So he's close. A short absence from home, so he spent some time away from home, had left his fair one unguarded by his attentions at this critical period. So he's saying like, because he had to leave home for a while, Henrietta was in danger of being taken away by another man. Talking about Henrietta like some chickens, right, was unguarded at this critical period. And when he came back, he had the pain of finding very altered manners. So Henrietta's behavior toward him is now different. And of seeing Captain Wentworth. Mrs. Musgrove and Mrs. Hayter were sisters. OK, so that's the family, right? So you have young Charles who broke his arm. Then you have Mary and Charles. Then you have Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove. and. Mrs. Musgrove's sister is Mrs. Hayter. And so uh, Henrietta is the same generation as Charles and Mary. So Charles Hayter is the same generation as well. So in fact, they're first cousins. Interesting. So they were sisters. They had each had money but their marriages had made a material difference in their degree of consequence. Material means significant. Uh, and it, it, there's a significant difference to how important they are. Mr. Hayter had some property of his own, but it was insignificant compared with Mr. Musgrove's. OK, so both men were common people, but Mr. Musgrove was richer. And while the Musgroves were in the first class of society in the country, the young haters would, from their parents' inferior, retired, and unpolished way of living, and their own defective education, have been hardly in any class at all, but for their, but for their connection with Uppercross. Wow. The, Jane, Jane Austen is being very unkind to the hater family. Their parents are inferior, which means lower class or like worse. They are retired, so they're not working. And they have an unpolished way of living, which means they have bad manners. And they had a defective education, so not a very good education. And then finally, the Hater family are poorer, poorer than the Musgroves. Uh, and so therefore the Hayter family would not have any status at all, except that they're related to the Musgrove family. Uh, this eldest son, of course, accepted. So Charles Hayter is the best of the Hayter family. He had chosen to be a scholar and a gentleman and who was very superior in cultivation, Shouyang, and manners to all the rest. So we've seen the movie. We know that Mary doesn't really like the idea that Henrietta would marry Charles Hayter. She thinks that it's uh, marrying somebody worse. 
Xia Jia. Uh, and here we see why, because the Hater family apparently is not as good as the Musgrove family, even though Charles Hater is the best of that family. Because marriage is never just about two people, right? Marriage is always about two families. OK, let's stop here uh, before next week. Please finish up to chapter 12. I believe chapter 12 is when Louisa has the accident.